Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater uh, Continuing Education Office. We host the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services and have been doing so since 1983. We celebrated 40 years last fall. Um, this semester, we're focusing on the world of the arts, which means we have lectures on music, on film, on literature, a little bit of everything from the world of the arts. Um, so today, let's go ahead and get started with, with today's presentation. Our presenter is Michael Y. Bennett. He's an associate professor of English and affiliated faculty in philosophy at UW-Whitewater. In addition to being a past fellow at the Institute for Research in the Humanities at UW-Madison, he is a life member of Clare Hall, University of Cambridge, where he was a visiting fellow. A theater theorist and critic known for his work on absurd drama, philosophy of theater, Edward Albee, and Oscar Wilde. He is the author or editor of 15 books. Please welcome Professor Michael Y. Bennett. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I do apologize for having to sit here. My back went out yesterday, so I'll do my best. Uh, normally, I'm much more active and uh, uh, energetic with, with this. Uh, I'll, I'll be reading a little, kind of riffing off a little as well. So. Um, uh, again, um, hopefully, hopefully you enjoy this, and, and hopefully maybe you know a little something more than about it than you I guess you actually knew um, coming in. So hopefully uh, we'll all we'll all get something good out of this. Um, so life is beautiful. The film uh, uh, w it w premiered in Italy in 1997 and the U.S. in 1998, and then won the Academy Award in 1999. Uh, and it won for Best Actor for Rob Roberto Benigni, uh, Best Original Dramatic Score, and Best Language Foreign, F Foreign Language Film, and was nominated for a total of seven Oscars, including Best Picture as well. Um, the film is simultaneously a movie about the Holocaust, but it's not necessarily about the Holocaust either. Um, but it's a movie more or less about a father and son relationship in the face of impending doom. Uh, the tale is simply about a Jewish family and a father, played by Roberto Benigni, who was able to clown around and make his young son laugh instead of having to face the horror of the typical but no less tragic uh, tale, tale from uh, village to ghetto to concentration camp. The haunting and poignant end when Benigni's character walks like, walks like a toy soldier towards his death, only his son who Benini's character is doing this for, cannot see the soldier around the corner that just after shoots his father, and the boy just stands there laughing. In the most ter terrifying final moment, Benini's character summons joy for his son, fill filling the audience with a joie de vivre and a peace for the with the world in his situation and his fate. The success of Life is Beautiful is, I argue, represents the culmination and coming to terms with one of history's most tumultuous centuries. When the, while the film did, did have its distractors, the notion of taking one of history's most horrific events and filming it with almost slapstick comedy um, ha had been an unimaginable, if not for the rise of tragic comedy over the course of the 20th century, with the antecedents starting around the mid to late 19th century. I argue that the move towards tragic, comic, tra for, to, towards tragic realism, away from the gaiety of the fin de siècle comedy, soon found more a mature and reflective form with the tragic comedy of the absurd. Once this nonsense decided and was replaced with sense, tragic comic realism became the default genre of 20th century theater. The artistic expression of tragic comedy reflected the movement of the psyche over the course of the century, of the 20th century. Exp uh, movement towards understanding the in inner self, first with Sigmund Freud, and the, the first Viennese school of the psychotherapy. Then the move toward the second school, Viennese school of psychotherapy, by expressing the exp unexplainable world uh, with a perceivable set, uh, nonsense or the admixture of life through interiority, but also by understanding that the individual is in relation to society, as was Adler's, um, Alfred Adler's uh, school of psychotherapy. Uh, and then after that, it went, it went back to a movement to the external, but in relation to how the internal worlds re respond to the external worlds. So this is like Victor E. Frankel's uh, third Viennese school of psychotherapy. Well, while you're trying to make sense of your interiority 
based upon external circumstances. And finally, how to make actually how to make sense and live well in our both our internal and external worlds, which is represented by contemporary con cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the dominant form of psychotherapy today. Uh, the, this ignorance is bliss of the 1890s saw a desperate need for sense. So going back to the 1890s, we saw a desperate need, need for sense. And following the Great War, obviously World War I, the response was nonsense and tragedy. Following World War II, there was a movement back to sense and eventually to understanding. In short, the rise of tragic comedy over the 20th century coincided with a, more, with a move towards understanding the external world as it truly exists, both, in tra both tragic and comic, and that our internal vision and worldview, as a response to this external world, is both tragic and comic as well. Effectively, the external and our internal real re realities both support a tragic comic worldview. Uh, and so, uh, I want to take you a little through. Uh, I actually, I'll, I'll actually skip all this because it's boring for me. Uh, and I might as well talk a little bit about tragic comedy more. So, um, tragic comedy really kind of has its roots. Uh, even as early as ancient Roman, Greek, and Roman theater. Uh, and um, uh, you can kind of see a hint of this, right? Aristotle has his uh, famous book, Poetics, where he basically has an, uh, the narrative arc that is called the Aristotelian arc, where tension rises, conflict rises, hits a climax, and then everything kind of falls from there, and then there's a nice resolution. Um, but uh, he kind of hinted at what comedy would be like as well, right? The exact opposite and reverse, right? But basically, you have a kind of setting of the stage. Uh, every, everything would kind of move to disorder. There'd be kind of a climax where everything kind of starts making sense again. And then you have a move to a nice, happy ending. Uh, and that, 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 for many, many of thousands, a couple, actually, a good thousand year, uh, that was the kind of the default. You either had a tragedy or you had a comedy. Uh, and then in the kind of the 15th, centuries, uh, you start having some, something called a pastoral comedy, where you start mixing the two elements. Uh, that went away for many, many, many hundreds of years, really until you, hit the, until you hit the middle of the 20th century, where you have the first really self-build uh, tragic comedy, which is Waiting for Godot. Um, and that's 1952 and 1953. Uh, uh, I, I will go. I will go. I, I will. I will. I will kind of go back a little now in the 20th century to kind of give you the, the the first. I want to give you the big, broad view, and then I'll go kind of back into the 20th century, and then how we get to 1953, uh, and waiting for Godot. Samuel Beckett's waiting for Godot. Um, so uh, is there a clock anywhere? That can, no, I guess not. All right. Oh, I see over there. Uh, waiting back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, w basically, the 1890s were a time of real economic success, certainly in the UK, um, and somewhat in the United States as well. And so you see a lot of plays that kind of mirror this kind of gaiety of the 1890s. Um, uh, you know, the big playwrights of the time in the 1890s were Oscar Wilde, for example, right, who had his fun comedies of manners. Um, uh, they would, you know, poke fun at high society. Uh, it would be all about wit and witticism, right? The, the wittier, the better the play, uh, or the wittier, the better the character. Um, you know, little one-liners would, would kind of populate these plays. Um, uh, but uh, once you kind of p get past the 1890s, uh, there's, there's this move to tragic realism. Uh, and, um, uh, in, in that's, and that's really kind of coincides with World War I, with the, the Great War. Uh, I mean, a after all, you know, no one saw a war like that coming, and and, and certainly um, uh, it certainly shook shook the world and shook shook artists around the world as how a war, war like that could have happened. Um, so what you really have following World War World War One is you really see a uh, a movement towards tragic realism, right? Where where really you're starting with Eugene O'Neill, um, a lot of the plays of Eugene O'Neill, uh, they he would have. He basically, he kind of got uh, uh, the family room drama, uh, the tragic family room drama became kind of the default genre of American theater in the, in the early, early to mid 20th century. Uh, plays like 
uh, uh, you know, uh, The Iceman Cometh, the plays like Long Day's Journey Into Night, if any of, the, of you are familiar with those, are, um, are kind of modern classics that, that look at kind of how, uh, how family dynamics um, really were um, um, something to, to kind of focus in on and find the tragic elements of life that a lot of things derive from the kind of interiority of people and their, their kind of the dynamics of the family. Um, but, what, but once you get kind of past Eugene O'Neill, uh, you start moving to plays like uh, Tennessee Williams, uh, you know, um, a lot of the death car uh, streetcar named Desire, uh, uh, Arthur Miller, Death of a Salesman, and these are kind of these kind of modern, modern classics where they're not really funny plays. Um, they're, they're wonderful plays, they're absolutely amazing plays, um, and they're heart-wrenching, uh, they kind of touch on every emotion except for comedy, um, and for, for the most part. Maybe you have a line here or there, but for the most part, these are really looking at um, really kind of tough, tough situations that people found, uh, you know, kind of through, through growing up with other family members, uh, through, uh, through society as, at, at large, uh, through through a whole host of things, through their own disappointments, their own failures as well, um, and so um, uh, that those were the, that's kind of what you had in the kind of the 30s through 40s and the early 50s, um, and then once you hit the kind of the the kind of the World War II and the Holocaust, um, you know, then the world if everyone thought the world went crazy over world, the Great War, uh, really people thought the world went crazy after World War II. Um, and so kind of people started to understand and playwrights, especially playwrights, started to think about how, how, how the world, um, how you know, something this nonsensical could make, make its way on stage um, and how something nonsensical could have happened in real life. Um, and so because of that, uh, you, you have a play like Waiting for Godot. Uh, just had a quick raise of hands. Anyone, how many of you have heard of Waiting for Godot or have read? Oh, okay, good. So about almost half of you. Uh, for those who have not read it or seen it, uh, uh, Waiting for Godot is a play where basically you have two, two uh, they're kind of self-described tramps or, or, um, that, that basically they, 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 they have bowler hats and they're from the 18, they were born, they grew up in the 1890s. Um, this is now taking place in about the 1940s and 50s. And they're waiting for someone named Godot. And they're, they're two friends. They supposedly, seemingly, have been waiting there for up to 50 years, every day waiting for this guy named Godot, who never shows up. Um, uh, and, and they kind of just wait and bide their time throughout the day, and the audience waits with them. Um, now, uh, for, for a very long time, this play was seen as kind of a very despairing, uh, very bleak play. Um, you know, basically, they're waiting for something, something like some godlike figure that never comes, right? It would make sense after World War II that, you know, everyone's, where, did, where was God during the Holocaust? Where was God during World War II? Never came, right? Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of recent criticism has really kind of um, looked and reshaped that and gone back and said, hmm, you know what? These two have really had everything they needed, right? Um, waiting, uh, uh, Vladimir and Estragon, again, the two main characters, they kind of complement each other in kind of very fun ways. Vladimir is kind of the philosophical one. Uh, Estragon kind of always thinks, think, is thinking about things with his body. His shoe hurts. He's hungry. Uh, Vladimir, Vladimir needs to go to the bathroom. Um, he, he, uh, Estragon can't sleep. Um, so these are kind of like, th it's almost like the odd couple, a very er early version of uh, the TV show, The Odd Couple, where, where basically it's, 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 it's uh, you know, either not, not necessarily romantically involved, but it's an old wedded couple, right, that bickers sometimes, has fun sometimes, trying to figure out what to do for the next moment. Uh, and um, uh, I'm sure uh, many of you here have some, some relation to, uh, to understanding what that must feel like um, growing old with somebody, um, uh, um, if you're fortunate enough to. And so, um, yeah, I think Waiting for Doe really kind of captures this sense that, you know, kind of like our lives are, are very mundane, but we try to make the best of it as we can, uh, and we try to um, understand and, and find joy wherever we can. Um, most things are not necessarily, most of our days are, you know, pretty mundane, right? I mean, wake up, eat, go to the bathroom, 
do it all over again, do it all over again, right? And then, and then, and then, and then, right? And then you do it again the next day. And um, waiting for Godot kind of captures that 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 type of realism. Not 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 that like again, not that you're sitting, just going to stand outside and wait for someone named Godot for 50 years with a friend. Um, but there's something much more realistic about life. Um, that, that a play that, that that demonstrates basically the little things, the little mundane things, aspects of life, um, and so this play was uh, this kind of, it was kind of a sensation. Um, that's that's an understatement. Um, uh, in its original in, uh, reception uh, in uh, in Paris uh, was mixed when it went to London in 1954. It was basically booed off the stage. Uh, critics basically bashed it, except for one. Uh, and then it made it to the United States in 1956, and uh, uh, critics were, everyone was kind of curious, like what was this play that everyone's been talking about? Um, but uh, it was billed as self-billed as a tragic comedy. So it's, again, it's called Wayne Friedo, A Tragic Comedy in Two Acts. Um, and this had a very lot lasting effect on the theater, and also the psyche of uh, kind of uh, theater goers, uh, and as well as um, the, on the psyche of audiences as well. Um, uh, after Waiting for Godot, you start seeing a, a kind of a movement uh, towards um, plays that, again, kind of, they kind of get rid of, I remember I showed you that Irish Aristotelian arc, right? Um, so they kind of, the beginning of the Aristotelian arc is usually setting the stage, right? Um, kind of have a sense of who these characters are, right? What's their background? What's going to be the background for the, for the, for the, um, uh, for the play as a whole, what's the conflict, things like that, right? And then there's a rising conflict, right? And then there's some climax, and then something re resolves, right? Well, these plays of the absurd, um, which often took this kind of tragic comic form, uh, they basically got rid of the beginning, and they got rid of the end, and then they turned all the action on the side. Um, so it was basically was like, it was just like a, a rising funny, sad, funny, sad, funny, sad, funny, sad, and um, you would not necessarily know the context. And, and there is something much more realistic about that um, uh, than, than most uh, standard plays. Um, again, uh, plays often are th thought about as, breaking, uh, as, 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 as revealing the fourth wall. So the fourth wall would be like, look, we're all here, right? If there, if there was a wall right between us, right? And um, uh, you were just occupying your day and I was looking in, I would just see life as it was lived, right? Um, and so that's kind of what you're supposed to do when you're, when you're at the theater, right? You, you're supposed to kind of mirror, see a mirror of real life. Um, and, and, you know, to, to, to have all this action that, 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 that's kind of very unrealistic in most plays, right? Um, uh, is, and, and kind of such a, such a tr true dramatic arc, right? I mean, how many, how many times is your, is your week entirely tragic or entirely comic? Uh, on, on the reverse, um, but really, um, you basically, every day is a little bit of something, right? A little bit of, of, of both, right? Um, some days your some days your days are a little more better than others, and some days they're they're worse than others, right? But even within those days, you might have a uh, you know the, the, your your bad days, you might have a little chuckle here and there, or or whatever. It's someone a friend, you see a friend that you, you that you haven't seen for a while, and you have a smile, right? Um, uh, that's kind of what tragic comic comedy is trying to trying to really capture and um, in, in in the 1950s and 60s uh, you also you, you see that you see that kind of um, kind of the worldview that kind of tone of these plays where they would just kind of go back and forth between something very serious and then something very light um, and it kind of felt like a whiplash to a lot of audiences who were used to these plays of like Ar you know Arthur Miller Eugene O'Neill uh, Tennessee Williams, et cetera, et cetera, Thornton Wilder, things like that, um, or even even the, the plays of Shakespeare. Um, so one, one, again, once you get to the '60s, you start seeing you start seeing plays that have really only take this form, uh, where where again you really don't have the subtext of what's actually happening in the story. It's kind of almost like a detective novel, but you're never going to find out what actually happens, right? Um, that we're, we're, we're constantly looking for the clues. We have these clues in front of us, but we're not going to know because, again, we didn't see the whole, we haven't seen, like, the, the life of the entire characters. We came in, in a sense, in, in, in the theater. Um, the, when, the, when the curtains open, right, 
you're seeing a, a, them mid, midlife, right? You're seeing the characters midlife. Um, you're seeing a slice of their life, but we're not, we're not seeing any kind of forced um, uh, dramatic action or dramatic conflict. Um, so uh, so that, that, that really kind of represented uh, kind of the culmination of the Viennese schools of, 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 of psychotherapy. Again, Sigmund Freud was starting to think about interiority. Until then, right, um, there were, you know, I mean, people, there, was, there wasn't really psychology as a field um, until you get to, the, you know, basically 1900. Uh, and Sigmund Freud and, and this move from kind of thinking about just interior um, to kind of like interior in relation to, to the society around you, which is uh, Alfred Adler, the second Vienna school of psychotherapy. And then, then, then kind of like how, what do you mean what do you, and your purpose in the world as related to everyone else around you? That's Viktor Frankl uh, and the third Vienna school. Um, uh, that kind of all yielded in the 60s and 70s uh, to, to both plays that were just trying to capture life as it was, not trying to force any dramatic arc on them. Uh, and so you also see the rise of cognitive behavioral therapy, right? They, they kind, of got the, kind of the arts and the sciences go hand in hand as we see this move uh, throughout the century. Um, and uh, once you get to the, 60s, it's the 60s and 70s, you start seeing plays that, that really, that no longer uh, have kind of... Um, uh, have a dialogue that kind of is all mumble jumbled. Again, if you've read Wayne Frigo or seen Wayne Frigo, uh, you'll know exactly what I mean. And again, very unlinear uh, types of dialogue, back and forth dialogue. Uh, um, so if you haven't, if you haven't, again, if you haven't read or seen Wayne Frigo, uh, it's just basically it's, it's conversations that don't necessarily follow what the the, the next person is saying. Um, again, if you if you've read it or seen it, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, so once you, again, once you get to the 70s and 80s, then you start seeing uh, a move to the self and move to try to understand what the world is actually like uh, and, 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 and what our place in the world actually is. Uh, and once you get there, uh, again, you're, 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 you are kind of simultaneously seeing the rise of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is basically saying to yourself, look, what did I do? How can I talk to myself? How can I, how can I make this situation better for myself? Uh, this all takes you basically to uh, the end of the century where you can have a play like Life is, I mean, a movie like Life is Beautiful. Uh, again, Life is Beautiful is, is, a, is a, uh, a play, I mean, I'm sorry, a movie that really, again, would not be able to, would, would not really be able to make much sense or would be utterly beyond offensive uh, to people if we had it, you know, 30, 40 years before. Um, uh, not necessarily just because of what, what transpired in the meantime, but because the, the, the world wasn't really ready uh, uh, and had not kind of gotten used to that tragic, the, the tragic comedy, uh, the kind of the mix of, uh, of comedy and tragedy all in once. So, um, so I really want, just want to kind of just uh, conclude, start concluding. Um, Really, the success of the of, of the, the movie "Life Is Beautiful" uh, really represented the uh, the culmination and coming to terms with one of history's most tumultuous centuries, um, and really it, re it kind of reflected again uh, that the the sense of uh, uh, this movement towards we want we, we you know that 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 life is not all good, it's not all bad, it's not it's not a melodrama like you know. Um, with stock characters, it's not all. No one's, no one's a villain. No one's a, no one's a hero. Um, uh, everyone's a little bit somewhere in between, and that uh, the, the movies should reflect something like that. Uh, and life is beautiful again. Uh, be able to be able to have a you know uh, the one one of history's most horrific events, uh, and have comedy in that uh, really shows. And, and, to, and to be able to have critical success really shows that the, uh, uh, the world has kind of come and uh, kind of sat with um, tragic comedy and as kind of the default genre of, uh, of the 20th century as, as heading into the 21st century. So I, I think that's pretty much it. And if, uh, any questions? Uh, I wish I had video for you. Uh, some of the plays are, I, we, we have to show too much of the plays uh, to, to, to really demonstrate. But yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. We do have time for questions. If you have one, just raise your hand and I'll come around. 
Yeah, I'll be right there. Are you trying to say that modern plays of tragic comedy are a better representation of real life than historically plays have been? Uh, um, yes and no. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say that, 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 that c contemporary plays of tragic comedy, right? So basically from the 70s on. Uh, not necessarily a theater of the absurd. Theater of the absurd was trying to kind of find an interior way to look at truth, things that are truthful, but not necessarily mirror life. Um, so plays after that, uh, where, where there's kind of a tragic comedy el element, basically any play you go to that's written past the 1970s, more or less, more or less, um, or at least ones that are studied in college classrooms, are tragic comic in that the sense that there is a mixture of just a joy and sorrow, funny and la laughter and 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 and, uh, and, and pain. Um, uh, I think it, it, I'm saying that is much more realistic in terms of your everyday. Not necessarily they're mirroring the most realistic um, kind of uh, way of life, if that answers your question, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, I'll be right there. Mm -hmm. What was the phrase that the father used for his son about the parade? About the parade. I just I mean, Prince, I, mean I, I always think what he calls his wife, Princey Pesa. I mean, Princey Pesa. Um, I don't know the specific phrase. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. I'm sorry, off, off the top of my head. Yeah. Anybody else remember the phrase? Uh, did, did you ask how many people saw the movie? Oh, I didn't ask how many people saw that movie. I asked Waiting for Godot. How many people saw Life is Beautiful? Oh, that's it. Wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that that came out in the that came out when? Nineteen ninety nine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that, that won a lot of Oscars. It won it won three Oscars. It was nominated for seven Oscars. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was an Italian film. Uh Roberto Bonini was the, the star actor. He won an Academy Award for that. Yeah. He was the one, I, th I think there's a lot of film clips of it when he is at the Oscars and he's like right. jumping Climbing over. over all the seats. When he, when he was awarded the, 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 the Oscar, he was in the middle of, the, in the, middle of the, the, the rows and he literally climbed over all the seats to get his, uh, to get his award. Yeah, please. What was yeah. the name of the actors in that play? Uh, it will, you, mean, you mean Life is Beautiful? Yeah. That, uh, it's, a, it's a movie. Uh, Roberto Benigni is the, the, is the famous actor in that. Yeah, he, he does mostly like kind of slapsticky type of movies, uh, which is, again, which is very bizarre to think about. You're going to have a slapstick type of movie it, it, about the Holocaust. Yeah. So. Do, are there examples of tragic comedy films in the 21st century, or do you think uh, that's something that just marks the, well, the last century? Well, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, the, well, there, there's films and, and many plays. Um, for example, um, uh, there's a famous play by Edward Albee, one of his new plays, new, newer plays, called The Goat or Who is Sylvia? Um, I, 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 I uh, uh, have to figure out how to best p put this, but a, a, a very successful um, uh, Pritzker Prize winning architect, that's the big, that's like the Nobel for architecture, um, he falls in love with a goat. Um, he's, ha he's happily married, um, uh, so, he, so he says, um, but he just has a thing for one goat named Sylvia. Um, and, so, and so, yeah, I mean, it's hysterical, right? And, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's, it's utterly tragic. I mean, uh, I, without trying to spoil too much, the, go the goat does not meet a happy fate. Um, uh, and everyone feels betrayed. But at the same time, you know, his wife cannot kind of fulfill some of the things that the goat fulfills, um, which, again, is uh, kind of um, uh, something unique for him. But, uh, you know, again, most plays, again, really take, I mean, o almost, again, you put any, you go to any play that's written, again, certainly since the 20th century, uh, since the late 20th century, um, almost since the beginning of the 21st century, um, uh, if you look at, like, Pulitzer Prize winning plays, uh, Top Dog, Underdog, I don't know if anyone's ever seen that play, it won a, it won a Pulitzer, um, you know, it, it, you, you just, you just, there's just no, nothing ever is just straight comedy or straight tragedy anymore. You always just see that combination uh, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? 
seems like that could be applicable for our political uh -huh. exactly yeah too right? exactly right <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. yeah yeah what about uh, uh, sorry just one more I'm oh, like, sure, I'm sure, like please, no, yeah. no, I'm the question asker here but in your expertise is is plays and film but is there is there examples from like television or Oh sure yeah I mean well, if you think about um uh kind of uh, well let's see I would say um well let's, I'm just trying to think television I, I'm not much of a television watcher but again uh uh, TV shows like Modern Family, right? Um, you know, again, you, you, I mean, they're, they're comedies, but at the same time, there's like, they're actually dealing with actual serious kind of family issues. Uh, uh, on, the, on the reverse, uh, in terms of uh, kind of like serious shows that also have moments of levity are uh, shows like, I'm just trying to think of what, what a lot of people might see here. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, Succession. Succession has a lot of moments of, I mean, again, very serious, very kind of dramatically hard-hitting, but there's a lot of moments of levity, you know, that kind of you're laughing at. Um, uh, yeah, again, I, TV's a little out of my purview, but, okay. but, the, but, but still, I think most, okay. most things, yeah, have that kind of admixture, yeah. Yeah, it seems like a concept you could, you could right. think about a lot in lots right. of different areas, so. Yeah, uh, here, right here. Huh? Do you think that the... Uh, the pure musical or escape or or you know just fun kind of shows are pretty much gone now or or where have they gone ah that, that that's a great que great question uh, i i don't think they're they're necessarily gone i think the thing is it depends what what, what when we're when we're talking about uh, most plays, I, when I'm saying plays, I'm not talking about musicals. So me, the kind of like your Broadway musical is almost its own genre itself. That is really, I mean, the point of most, I'm not gonna, make, I'm not gonna say every musical, is really entertainment, right? And many of the points of, again, uh, uh, theater, again, not, not, that, not that there's not some, there's, not, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, and believe me, I actually love musical theater myself. Um, but there, really, there's kind of two purposes, two different purposes, where there's generally more of a, it's more of an artistic endeavor, theater itself, right? You're going to see a play than if you're going to see musical theater. And it's reflected upon where, where it is, right? Broad, you know, mostly musicals come out of Broadway, or their goal is to make it to Broadway. Um, uh, these are huge budget, um, you know, huge price tag things that you're going to spend, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars for a family of four to go, um, you're basically paying for entertainment. Not, you're not paying necessarily uh, for, for, for a th going to an art house cinema or something like that. So I, I think it's not, not necessarily that it doesn't exist, it's just in, in a different place than it used to be necessarily. Yeah. Um, there, there, I mean, there is, there is pure comedy. I'm not saying every, again, we're talking about for, but for plays, for plays, you, 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 there's really rarely, like something happened on the way, the funny thing happened on the way to the forum. You don't see, you don't see, do you, do you know that play or, yeah, right? Um, some of you know that, right? You don't really see just pure, joy, joyful, um, silly comedies anymore. You just don't see those anymore. Um, uh, do you see some revivals? Uh, there was a, a one man, two governors uh, was uh, was a very um, uh, was a very successful revival of a 17th century uh, kind of uh, um, uh, commedia della arte um, that, that was a, it won a bunch of awards it won, it won a Tony as well uh, I was lucky enough to see it on Broadway um, but again for, for the most part people who are writing are not just they, they, there's just not there's just not that. We're going to write one or the other. You just see an admixture. Yes, there are things that are more comedic than others, right? And there are plays that are more tragic than 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 comedic. Um, but it just it's just, it's just the, the, the basically the de default is just that there's some admixture of the two. And if you see if you see any good really good movies in the last 15, 20 years, you'll probably know you'll probably start to think about that as as you're watching that. There's not, there's not, you don't really just have straight tragedy. You don't really have, just have straight comedy anymore. On TV, TV you do. Definitely on television, you do. Uh, definitely ho so, some Hollywood blockbuster films. Action films are sometimes just, just pure action. Um, uh, but for the most part, uh, certainly on the stage, uh, you, you, do, you, you just, there's just, just not like one or the other. Thank you. How would you classify Stephen's sometimes musicals? 
Um, yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I, I, I'm not a musical expert, a musical theater expert. Um, and so, again, uh, to, to me, they're, they're, they're in the realm of, of musical, and musical is a, more of an entertainment, um, and it has historically been in that realm. But, 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 but again, I, with, the, with musicals, there are musicals, for example, um, like Les Mis, right, Les Miserables, um, which really uh, is entirely tragic, right? There's not really any funny parts or life parts of Les Mis. Um, there are musicals like Cabaret, which are utterly in, in between, right? You have hysterical moments. You have, you have moments where, um, you know, the, the Nazis are in the background, the, 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 the whole uh, cabaret. Um, you have, you kind of hit every version of life. Um, again, I, it's a little out of the purview of what, what, what kind of contemporary plays are doing. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I wouldn't totally be able to answer, but I'm saying musical theater, for the, for the most part, is still trying to, again, working on that kind of the Broadway um, for entertainment value. Not that there's not some, ser again, not that there's not some seriousness to, uh, or a kind of thought behind what they're doing, so. We will actually wrap uh, up our series. Our very last lecture in the series in April will answer the question, is the golden age of the Broadway musical over? Ah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, there you go. Yeah. Hmm? What's your thoughts about the death of a salesman? Was that a bad timing? Ah, bad timing? Is that what you said? People who aspire to be salesperson, and then they showed that film, right. it was a downer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well so, so the film's really, I mean, the play was really written, it was, uh, is, I think it's 1948 off the top of my head, right when the play is, right? Uh, the, the, fil the, fil the film is much... Uh, the films, plural, are, are much later. Uh, so um, uh, it's a total downer. And, and, and that, that really is kind of what um, earlier was I was saying, uh, is that once you, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, uh, you really only have downers. Every play. I mean, again, it's hard to find. And th th there were straight comedies, right? But, those, but in terms of what, what, what are studied, again, name a Tennessee Williams play that's funny. They're not funny. Right? Name a Eugene O'Neill play that's funny. They have a funny moment here and there. Uh, you know, name name a you know Arthur Miller play that's that has a line of comedy. They're not funny at all. Um, they're very they're very sad, tragic outlooks of life. Uh, and again, part of it is uh, you know um, this this was before kind of you know if you look at the, just just the United States, this is kind of really before kind of you you hit the boom after the after World War II. Um, uh, you, you know, the United States is still struggling for identity between the wars. Um, uh, but really, after the war, that, that, that's when you really start seeing kind of, uh, uh, that, that's when things change. That's when things really start to change. Once you hit the mid-50s, certainly by the 60s, uh, when the economy is booming. Uh, and really, once you get through plays like Waiting for Godot, uh, uh, Harold Pinsel plays, Eugene, uh, Edward Albee plays, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Does that ring a bell? Uh, there's a, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, right? Uh, that, that, that's an amazing film, by the way, uh, based, on, based upon a, his 1962 play, uh, where, again, it's utterly, utterly vile people fighting it out, but there's a lot of hope still in, 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 in that play and a lot of love in, 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 in the bitterness, so. Okay, I think we'll probably leave it there. And I'll note that um, we have no lecture next week, but the following week we're going to talk about film and plays again in terms of Shakespeare and Orson Welles. So in two weeks we'll talk about that with a colleague from uh, Professor Bennett's department. Mm -hmm. But for now, uh, join me in thanking Professor Michael Y. Bennett. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you.